In my initial introduction to, to Christianity, I many times came across the subject of how many people are actually going to heaven. Some try to give exact numbers, as we know some denominational groups, they try to give the exact number, even though their own group is much larger than the number they give. Others say it's relative, which is a little more accurate, that it's That number is relative. It will be relative. But it all boils down to what the Bible says. And what the Bible says is that only a few will enter. The question we're going to seek an answer for today is this. Why, according to the Bible, will so few be saved? You see, the first problem we run into in asking this question is that there are so many people who think that not a few people will be saved, but only a few will be lost. They think the opposite of what the Bible says, despite the fact that the Bible says only a few will be saved. First century Jewish rabbis debated how many will be saved, and they answered, Well, all the Jews would be saved and maybe a few Gentiles for good measure. Well, what does the Bible have to say about that? We may remember in the book of Exodus, God told Moses that none of his people over 25 would be allowed into the promised land except Joshua and Caleb. So these Jewish rabbis in the first century were not correct according to the Old Testament, and they certainly aren't correct according to the New Testament. There are others today, however, who will still say that a lot of people are going to be saved, and they'll point out to you Acts 20, chapter 2, verse 41. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and they were at it that day, About 3,000 souls. Doesn't that mean that there will be a lot of people who are going to be saved? Well, I tell you, if we had one-third of that being baptized today, I I, I think it's a miracle. But if a 1,000 people were baptized today here in front of us, it seemed like a crowd, doesn't it? It would take a while to get everybody through this baptistry behind me here. So it sounds like a lot of people, but that's not really. Not really a lot of people. Because according to Josephus, the first century historian, on a typical Pentecost in Jerusalem, there would be anywhere around 2 million people present. So out of 2 million, only 3,000 were baptized. That's only 0.15% of the people who were listening. 0.15%. And these were faithful Jews who made the journey, who would understand the coming of the Messiah, who would understand the Scriptures and the prophecies. These weren't, you know, non-practicing Jews. They made the journey. They were there on the day of Pentecost. They understood the Scriptures. Three million of those, two million of those, only 0.15%. There are still those that, that would point to Revelation 7, that in Revelation 7 we read about the great multitudes worshiping Him, wearing white robes. Now that, that means that a lot of people will be saved, right? Not really, no. Friends, there are over 6 billion people living in our world today. Not to mention all the billions They have lived since creation down until today. The ones that have passed before us. So I'll ask you, what is a great multitude compared to six billion plus some more billions? What would you consider seeing a a multitude? Uh, Have you considered a march of a million men or, or whatever march, whatever million grouping of people that you have seen? Do you consider that a notion of people? I know I would. I'd call that a multitude, wouldn't you? But do your math. I'm not going to do that math right now. You can do the math. What is one million? If there were one million so saved, sounds like a multitude to me, compare that to six billion plus a few billions on top of that. That is a fraction 
a fraction that is a few people. Even a multitude worshipping Him is a few people. The truth is that just a very few people will be saved. When some of Jesus Christ's disciples asked Him if only a few were going to be saved, He told them not only will a few be saved, but He also told them why only a few would be saved. If you followed along with Sean already, if you turn back to, to Luke 13, 22 through 30, let me read it one more time for you to understand what's going on. He went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem, and someone said to him, and here's the question, Lord, will those who are saved be few? That's what we're dealing with this morning. And in giving them the answer, he didn't just say only a few, he gave a whole why. Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us. Then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place there will be weeping, and gnashing of teeth, when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at the table of the kingdom of God, and behold, some are less who will be first, and some are first who will be last. Jesus gave four very specific reasons in this text why there would be so few people that would be saved. If you could, focus your attention for a moment on the first word Jesus spoke in answering that question. That will give us the first reason why only a few will be saved. Because only a few will strive He said strive. Some translations say make every effort. To strive is to devote serious effort or energy. To struggle in opposition to something. To strive. This Christian walk isn't supposed to be easy. Jesus never said that it would be. We have to struggle and fight every day in order to be saved. There are those today who would like for us to believe that once you're saved, you can't possibly be lost. That it doesn't matter what you do. That you can just take it easy. You're done being saved, so you're done. That is not what the Bible teaches. Paul tells us that it isn't easy. In fact, it's a fight. Three times, Paul calls the Christian faith the good fight. 1 Timothy 6.11, and then 1 Timothy 6.12, the very next verse, and then 2 Timothy 4, verse 7. We know that we must fight in order to be saved. That we must strive to overcome. But to overcome what? What do we strive against? Well, God tells us that too. That's in Ephesians 6, verse 12. It says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So there you have it. We overcome the cosmic powers over this present darkness the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Our fight is the hardest one of all because we fight against things we can't even see. Things we can't touch or wave a stick at it. We battle against the sinfulness of the world and even more than that, our own lust and desires. Paul went so far as to say that we are at war every day within ourselves. 
Romans 7, verse 23, it says, But I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind, and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. So not only we're fighting this good fight against the forces of evil and temptation and sin, we fight our own desires. We fight ourselves every day to stay on a straight and narrow, to stay on on the path of a narrow gate. However, we are not alone in our fight. Paul says in Colossians 1, uh, verse 29, he says, For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. If we choose to strive... We don't strive alone. If we choose to fight, we don't fight alone. God grants us the strength we need to overcome. But that's when we're striving to please Him. So why are only a few going to be saved? Because only a few will strive for salvation. The second reason why only a few will be saved, it's because the truth is narrow. Christ said the door into salvation is narrow. Enter through the narrow gate. A few will be able to enter through the narrow gate. Matthew 7, 13 and 14 says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Imagine the compass in an airplane. I I know technology has changed a lot, so I I don't know if you'll see uh, the the little uh, glass dome with the metal thing. David would know. Those are not there anymore, are they? (laughs) All digital now. (laughs) But, But imagine that little dome thing. You know there are about, not about, there are 360 degrees in that little compass. And as an airplane is is arriving, uh, and I'll tell you, um, I know a little bit about the the arriving, the taking off, and the landing of the airplanes, because I was in Brazil, a dispatch release, a load controller, and and so I knew exactly, I'd get in trouble if there was an accident, I'd be the first one in trouble, so I knew exactly that as an airplane is approaching, if there is, a, I'm going to round it up to one degree. If there is a one degree difference on that compass as it's approaching the runway, a one degree deviation, and you're in a heap of trouble, can be less than that, but let's just say one degree for the purpose of, of our round number here. One degree deviation, and you are in a heap of trouble. I wonder if it's my lapel mic, or if it's something else. I'm not touching anything. I'll turn off my lapel, I'll stay behind here. There you go. If it does it again, then... Is it Doug back there? (laughs) Anyway... Now think of that again. Let's go back since we got distracted. It takes only a one degree deviation. If Christ is talking about a narrow gate, if the chance to enter is that little, how much are people deviating from the truth? The truth is very narrow. Truth is absolute and has some hard things for people that do not want to hear it. And the less you want to hear about it, the less you want to strive for it. Why would I strive for something that does not line up with what I want? Well, because it's not about what I want, is it? And so we have the third reason. Few will be saved because people will delay. In verses 25 through 29, uh, we see the, the, the story about the party. And Jesus is not, uh, it's not a new thing, him using the, the party as an illustration for what's going on. But in this case, he's showing how people didn't take heed 
These people did not consider it important to respond immediately. They just fiddle around. I'm not ready to come into the party yet. They began to make excuses. Well, what are some excuses we can make today? Well, we went to church over there. We attended a devil. We were never baptized, but we attended regularly. For well, Acts twenty two sixteen it says, And now why do you delay? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on His name. Now here's the key question. Why do you delay? Only a few will be saved because God has given us plenty of time to run to Him. But yet so many of us, so many of, of people in this world, says maybe later. And then we have the argument, well, how about the person that is on the way for being baptized? They decided they want to, to put on Christ in baptism, but they want to wait until next Sunday when their family is in town. Why do you delay? Is your family being in town more important? It's worth the gamble of your eternal soul? Because that's on you. Whenever we choose to say, tomorrow I'll come into the party. Whenever we choose to say, next week I'll, I'll listen to God. It's not on God. It's not on Him. It's on us. So why are only a few going to be saved? First, because only a few are going to strive. Second, only a few are going to search for the narrow door. Third, because only a few are going to realize the urgency of obeying the gospel and in verse 30, we see the fourth and final reason Jesus gives uh, for why so few will be saved. And that is arrogance. The opposite of humility. When we place ourselves before God's will, we are in the same category with liars and unbelievers. Verse 30 says, And behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. Christ was talking about pride. We must humble ourselves to God's will and not our own. Yeah, the gate is narrow because it's not our will. Old, stubborn, human pride will cause more souls to be lost than any other emotion. And because we know the truth, it doesn't make us better than anyone. Here's an interesting uh, point for us. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Our sins nailed Christ to the cross as well as everyone else's. And knowing the truth, we should count ourselves blessed and be more thankful. What a depressing lesson, right? That's depressing. No, it's not. It's not depressing at all. Because think of Noah and the ark. I was trying to find, trying to research how long it took him to, to build the ark. Some people say 100, some say 120, they don't, some say 60 to 70. But decades upon decades it took him to build that ark. People had time. They had a chance over and over and over again to hear his preaching, to do something about it, to enter that boat. So it is not depressing because the, the door is open, the gangplank is down. How much more time do we need? How many times do we need to hear? What are the chances uh, that, that we're taking? It's not depressing. It will be depressing for those outside the door when the door shuts. 
In the case of Noah, when the, the rain started to pour, and people realized, oh, good old Noah was right. I better run that way. Now picture all those people. Yes, it is depressing for them because picture of them biting and scratching and grabbing with their claws and breaking their nails on those doors saying, please let me in. Too late. Now it's depressing. It's not depressing yet. And it won't be depressing for us because there will be no pain in heaven. For the few that will be saved, you don't have to, to feel the, the depression of what's going to happen outside the ark. And that door can be closed at any time. The question is, are you going to enter in? Now let me help you with that thought process. Yes, it is painful to think about all the lost souls. To think about all the people that need Christ and they're not going to be able to, to get to Christ because of their choices. All those things we talked about. But you know the best place to save somebody who's drowning? Ideally, if you can, it's from the pool deck. Not from the water. If I don't have to get in the water to save that person, if I can just reach the, the, the tube, reach the, the assistance device, that is the best place to save someone. The best place to bring people on board, it's from the boat. Because and the Bible says, what profits a man if he saves the entire world and loses his own soul? So I guess what I'm telling you is this. If you truly care about the lost souls, and they're the reason why you don't want to jump in a boat because uh, how can a loving God have those many people saved? Well, get in a boat and then work on saving them. And that's what I'm asking you to do this morning. The Bible says only a few would be saved. Do you want to be part of that few? The Bible says only those who are in Christ will be saved. And how do you put on Christ? Well, you believe in Him first. You repent from your sins as we, we discussed in class this morning. We saw the act, action, act of repentance in the Philippian jailer helping Paul and Silas. And then you confess Christ as your Savior. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation, and then you wash your sins away in the waters of baptism. Then, I'd say then, you can worry about those lost souls. Because then you can share the good news that you yourself have experienced. So if you would this morning, if you need to respond to the invitation, if you need to return to Christ, or if you need to put on Him in baptism, we ask that you come forward as together we stand and as we sing.